Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on this Friday. My name is Josh. I'm going to be uh, moderating the webinar here today. We have uh, Dr. Chang, our board certified ophthalmolog ophthalmologist and fellowship trained uh, corneal and refractive surgeon today. I'm uh, going to talk to you a little bit about dry eye. Uh, a couple housekeeping things here before we start uh, on the panel there that you see for GoToWebinar. Um, in the, towards the bottom of that, you'll see a tab that says questions. If you guys have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to put those in there. Uh, after we go through the information here towards the end, I'll be asking Dr. Chang those questions and uh, facilitating that piece. So, you know, even if it's in the middle of the webinar, feel free to put your question in there to save that and we'll answer those in the order that they were asked as we go through the webinar here. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass this over to Dr. Chang and uh, enjoy everybody. Hello everyone, um, I'm Dr. Chang. I'm gonna do a dry eye webinar today and hopefully you can uh, find some good information if you're suffering from dry eyes. Uh, we'll start with the first slide. So what is dry eye? Well, dry eye is a condition when you are not producing enough tears. So it's basically a tear deficiency. Uh, in addition to having a deficient tear, you may not have the right type of tear. And the tear is a very complex um, um, issue where there's many different layers. And if something is not quite right with the structure of the tear film, um, you may be uh, suffering from dry eye. Next slide. So why are tears necessary? Well, the tears keep the surface of your eyes smooth, hydrated, and protected. So not only is it a important refractive layer in order to give you sharp vision, it also protects your eyes from infections, uh, has a protective quality as well. There's three layers to the tear film. The outermost layer is called the lipid layer. And that lipid layer is made by the meibomian glands, which are these oily glands that are located in the eyelid. Uh, they're located in the upper and lower eyelid, and they are secreted by these tiny little pores that um, um, uh, lubricate the eye. Uh, these pores are lined just posterior to your eyelashes. The watery layer, which is the aqueous layer, is kind of in the middle of this sandwich of, of, of the, the tear film. The aqueous layer is produced by the lacrimal glands. And the lacrimal glands are these glands that are located uh, in the upper part of your eye, just kind of up into the and, and temporal uh, to your eyeball. And they secrete tears, which are then spread evenly with your blink. And the last layer is called the mucus or mucinous layer. And this is a very, very important layer as well. It is kind of the base or the foundation of the tear film. The mucus layer is produced by the uh, conjunctiva, which is that membrane that uh, lays over the white part of your eye. And when you have this uh, uh, three-part tear film, uh, we kind of look at the qualities of all three of them. Next slide. The dry eye symptoms are varied and broad. Uh, they can include tearing. Uh, it may sound counterintuitive, but if you are experiencing excessive tearing, that could be a sign that you're um, uh, um, experiencing dry eye symptoms. Uh, there's itching, stinging, burning, redness, light sensitivity, eye fatigue, blurry vision, and a gritty foreign body sensation. Um, you can have all these, or you may not have any of these, um, but uh, most frequently people will come to our clinic complaining of one, if not several of these symptoms. Next slide. So there's, a, can we go back to the last one? I think we skipped one. Oh, next slide. Excuse me. So there's um, two types of dry eye. Uh, we have one, the evaporative dry eye. What occurs is if there is a um, issue with the lipid layer, the outermost layer of the tear foam, then there can be quicker evaporative loss of the aqueous layer. That lipid layer acts as kind of a, a protective barrier to keep 
the hydration on the eye. If the uh, lipid layer is uh, deficient in some way, then there'll be uh, more uh, evaporation of the underlying aqueous layer. And people have lots of fluctuations in their vision, even from moment to moment. The other um, type of dry eye is the um, aqueous deficient dry eye. And that is simply uh, the lack of uh, tear production. Lack of tear production is a normal age-related phenomenon. As we grow older, we do produce less. Uh, if we're in our 50s or 60s, we're essentially producing less than half of the tears we used to produce when we were in our 30s. As we get older, we produce less and less, unfortunately. All the joys of aging. <clears throat> if we live in a very arid environment like Colorado, we'll have a worsening uh, production of uh, tears and also will have more evaporative loss as well. Next slide. Uh, proper diagnosis equals effective treatment. And that's very much true for any sort of medical condition. But when it comes to uh, dry eyes, uh, we can essentially tailor our therapies uh, depending on what type of dry eye you have. Over-the-counter eye drops are the initial kind of uh, therapy we advise, but for some patients, they may only provide a temporary relief. It may only last uh, seconds even. Without knowing the type of dry eye that you may have, uh, you may be kind of just uh, spinning your wheels and, uh, and, and delaying proper diagnosis and treatment. Next slide. So diagnosis, well, really the, the, we initially start with our diagnosis with the clinical examination. Uh, we would um, schedule an appointment. Uh, we take a, a detailed history, uh, listening to what your symptoms are. Then uh, at the slit lab, uh, we can assess um, kind of where uh, and what type of dry eye uh, problem you may have. So the clinical exam is really the most important part. Um, we do have other kind of uh, more sophisticated diagnostic uh, equipment to help assess uh, the type of dry eye you may have. Here we have a picture of uh, the lipid view and the lipid flow machine. And this is a machine that we have uh, had for about eight months or so, and we can assess some areas of your dry eye that we couldn't uh, do before. The Lippy View interferometer is a very sophisticated camera that can assess the quality of your tear film. It is mostly uh, useful in, in the um, lipid deficient type of dry eye. It can calculate the thickness of your tear film and kind of areas where it's inconsistent and, and if it's spread very inconsistently as well with your blink. Uh, so it gives us a, a host of uh, information uh, that can be quantified. The meibomian gland evaluator is a very, very helpful. Uh, we take these uh, retroilluminated pictures of your meibomian glands, and there's approximately about 30 glands in the upper and lower eyelid. We can see how healthy they are, uh, if there's any atrophy or scarring or any plugging of the glands. Uh, this will help us uh, know where you're at in your type of uh, dry eye uh, state, and we can uh, address an appropriate therapy uh, with uh, lipid flow. Next slide. So the lipid flow is a uh, automated machine that provides um, a lot of relief for this evaporative slash mobomian gland dysfunction of dry eye. Um, the lipid flow is essentially these two iPads that um, allow us to uh, apply heat and pulsation to open up those pores that uh, are plugged up with the uh, oily material. With the lack of flow, uh, patients will have more evaporative dry eyes. The, the 
the um, goals of the lipid flow are to reestablish flow so that we can have the oils spread evenly across the eyes to um, uh, provide a more normal tear film. And also by uh, decreasing inflammation caused by the stasis of the oils, we can help prevent further damage to these glands, which are very prone to um, atrophy and scarring over time. So earlier diagnosis is a, a key part of dry eye therapy. Um, other options, if you're kind of just starting to have symptoms, uh, we have uh, artificial tears that we uh, promote, but we also have prescription eye drops. And these eye drops are different. They're not lubricating eye drops. They're eye drops uh, designed specifically to reduce inflammation associated with aging. Next slide. Um, just to um, uh, go back to the last slide, please. So you may have uh, heard of the most popular dry eye medication, Restasis, that is uh, cyclosporin. Uh, these medicines work by reducing inflammation on a cellular level and help promote more tear production. We are having more of these dry eye medications available. Um, Zydra was, um, is another dry eye medication that came out a couple of years ago. We have Sequa, which is another cyclosporin vehicle. We also have compounded um, cyclosporin and Clarity. And all these are very, very effective. And um, earlier, earlier adoption uh, is key to preventing further damage. Next uh, slide. Um, once again, here is that uh, lipid flow that I mentioned. Uh, it is a bilateral uh, process. Uh, in the picture, the lady only has her first uh, iPad place, but both eyes would have this uh, placed uh, inside the eyes. The pads go on the outside and the inside of the upper and lower lids. And I've had it done myself, and it's very, very comfortable. It's a very um, uh, mild heat, and there's this compression that you can hear and feel, and it's, it's essentially trying to milk out the um, blockages. It lasts about six, uh, 16 minutes. Uh, the results uh, uh, of uh, improvement and reestablish a flow are usually seen within six to eight weeks period. The average mean improvement of dry eye symptoms is roughly around 50%. Um, I tell my patients I've had it done and I feel about 40% better. It's not going to cure dry eyes, which is a chronic disease, but it can certainly help in the right individuals have a uh, um, uh, better symptomatology. Next slide. Um, punctal plugs are another um, part of our arsenal of dry eye therapy. Uh, they can be either collagen or acrylic plugs, and these little uh, cork-like uh, uh, um, uh, little plugs that go into your tear ducts can uh, preserve and maintain the tears that you're producing and adding. Uh, it's akin to uh, plugging up a little drain in the sink. If you have it plugged and, and there's some fluid in the drain, it kind of preserves it from being cleared with each blink. It's very comfortable. It takes about um, one or two seconds to place. We can remove them at any time. Uh, they can uh, be effective in the right individual as well, period. Uh, period. Next slide. Um, so we did mention some of the other um, prescription eye drops a couple slides ago. Here's a picture of Zydra and Restasis, uh, both anti-inflammatory eye drops. Uh, the typical dosing is twice a day. They do require some time to become effective. Uh, the Restasis typically takes four to six months to have a, a, a big clinical uh, jump in your improvement. The Zyja works a little bit quicker, more like four to six weeks. Both are effective. Sometimes one drop will be more effective for an individual than the other. Um, the uh, side effects are minimal. These are among the safest drops you can use. The most common side effect uh, for these drops uh, are stinging. Uh, if you have dry eyes, virtually every drop will cause a certain amount of stinging. Stinging is... Uh, is will will improve over the first several weeks uh, uh, as the inflammation decreases. 
Next slide. So uh, we had a quick overview of what dry eye uh, comprises of, the types of dry eyes, and some of the therapies that we have. Um, I'm going to go over some frequently asked questions, and then I'll open up the forum for any individual questions here. Um, do dry eye treatments hurt? Well, yes and no. The different treatments that we provide typically do not cause pain, but depending on the severity of dry eyes, it can cause stinging. Um, and uh, hopefully that uh, clinical factor will improve and is also a marker of improvement uh, of your ocular surface. The lipid flow is painless, uh, feels uh, very spa-like. Um, you are um, usually here for about an hour and there's uh, one or two um, follow-ups to make sure that uh, there has been efficacy uh, with this uh, procedure. Eye drops, the temporary stinging is uh, common. Uh, the punctal plugs are not um, uh, painful. There is a small percentage, maybe in one or two percent in my practice, where they can still feel that plug if it is not a good fit. And if they do feel that plug rubbing against their eyes, we can um, remove it very easily in the office. Next slide. So why is it important to treat dry eyes? Well, the dry eyes can lead to very, very serious problems. Uh, with the uh, diminished uh, protective barrier of the tear film, uh, one can be uh, at serious risk for eye infections. Uh, corneal ulcerations are a uh, very common problem uh, in severe dry eyes. And with a corneal ulcer, one can um, uh, lose a tremendous amount of vision. Uh, the chronic inflammation can cause uh, neovascularization of the cornea. Uh, neovascularization of the cornea is when blood vessels that are, are not seen in the cornea start um, developing as a uh, defensive reaction to chronic inflammation. This blood vessel formation can cause scarring, once again leading to permanent vision loss. It can lead you to increased incidences of a uh, corneal erosion. Um, uh, this can occur upon awakening, so corneal abrasions can be a common problem. Uh, the corneal ulcers are, are increased uh, as a result of severe dry eyes, and you can have permanent loss of vision. Next slide. Uh, why is uh, eye watering a symptom of dry eyes? Um, well, the cornea has uh, thousands and thousands of nerve endings, and if the corneal um, nerves sense that the eyes are dry or irritated, it'll send a reflex arc to the lacrimal glands and says, oh, my eyes are very dry. I need you to start uh, producing this reflexive tear to try to um, uh, keep the eyes more moist. The problem with this uh, reflex tearing is that those reflex tears do not help lubricate your eyes. So many people with this excessive tearing uh, mistakenly think that their eyes are not dry and that they're producing too much tears when in fact the opposite is true. Next slide. Um, causes of dry eyes, um, environmental causes. Uh, it's been very smoky with very poor air quality recently. That has been exacerbating many of our dry eye patients. Uh, smoking is a big factor in worsening dry eyes. Uh, contact lens wear can rob uh, the cornea of moisture and can exacerbate dry eyes. We live in a dry climate, as we talked about. Um, and certain uh, task-related rela uh, um, jobs can cause uh, worsening dry eyes. Working on computers that uh, most of us do in our jobs uh, can uh, make the dry eyes worse. When we're really trying to concentrate on uh, certain tasks like reading or working on the computer, our blink reflex goes down as well, causing more evaporative tear loss. Medical causes, blepharitis, which is inflammation of the eyelids, uh, underlying systemic diseases like arthritis, thyroid disease, or other connective tissue disease can cause 
uh, worsening dry eyes. In fact, it is the most common manifestation of uh, eye-related um, issues with these diseases. Uh, medications, virtually all medications will cause dry eyes. The very, um, uh, the most common usual suspects are antihypertensives, antidepressives. They can cause severe dry eyes. And any eye surgery can cause dry eyes. LASIK surgery, cataract surgery, eyelid surgery, they can exacerbate dry eyes. Typically, these are very, very temporary uh, and not permanent. Next slide. So um, dry eye and dry eye patients are a large part of my practice. I would say on a typical day, it can be uh, a quarter of the patients I see. That shows you how um, prevalent dry eye is. Um, there's a quite a, uh, a varied number of how, what percentage of the population it affects, but I would say that uh, um, as we are reaching our senior years, it virtually affects nearly everybody to a certain extent. Uh, but if you are feeling symptoms that uh, we had addressed earlier or having changes in your vision, um, I, I would recommend a uh, complete eye examination uh, with your um, uh, regular eye doctor or uh, at our clinic, at Skyline Vision Clinic, and we can kind of have a uh, expert uh, consultation on uh, the severity of your dry eyes and what type of treatment would be the most appropriate uh, to improve your um, quality of life. Um, I will open it up for any questions. Absolutely. Um, and so I have some questions here, Dr. Chang, that have been submitted throughout the process. Um, I do want to let everybody know uh, as we get into the question and answer period here and, and people may start dropping off here, uh, this presentation will be available to all of you after this. Uh, we'll go ahead and email you a link to that so that you can refer back to uh, anything that was reviewed in here and also share with any friends or family uh, that uh, maybe were not able to make it. Um, also, if you have emailed questions in um, that don't get answered during this uh, question and answer period, we will be following up with you via email to answer those questions um, and also, of course, offer uh, any conversations with our staff to help you talk through your options. So, uh, Dr. Chang, I think the first one that uh, I see come through here, uh, specifically in regards to prescription eye drops, a uh, patient mentioning that uh, Zydra being about $500 a month uh, for treatment through their eye drops. Uh, cost comparison to some of the treatments that you have referred to today, how do they compare to a, a prescription eye drop regimen for a typical patient? That's an excellent question. Um, I would say the uh, greatest barrier for our treatment of dry eyes is cost for these prescription medications. It's quite frustrating. And um, um, I think uh, it's a reflection of some of the the issues we have with our um, current medical uh, uh, insurance uh, carriers. Um, so one of the things that occupies quite a bit of our time is trying to figure out which is the most cost-effective eye drop. Um, everyone's formulary for their ins particular insurance can, um, um, can either cover one, both, several, or none. Um, and what a individual um, pays for based on their formulary uh, can be um, uh, a difficult challenge. If I were to, for example, um, saw you and gave you a prescription Zydra, I, I don't necessarily know what is covered by your formulary. Um, we do have um, kind of the backup plan of having uh, a replacement. I can replace it with a different type of eye drop if it's covered and it's cheaper. Um, but um, that is very frustrating. We, it, it's just hard for us to decipher how much it's going to cost. So if um, Zydra is not covered and it's $500, then we may suggest Restasis, and Restasis may come out by 50. We may suggest Sequa, it may come out to be 50. And if all these options are too onerous, um, and, it, and it is for many patients, then our, our final option on a prescription uh, cyclosporin would be Clarity, which is that compounded cyclosporin from Imprimis Labs, which is the largest eye compounding pharmacy in the country. Uh, their um, average cost for a three month supply would be a, a $50 um, um, charge for a, a, a bottle. 
that bottle lasts about five weeks. You may you may stretch out four months with a three month supply. That's about as uh, as uh, cheap and as economical as it gets. But we do have patients who um, have it covered and they may pay twenty dollars. So um, um, it's just kind of the labyrinth of uh, um, issues we have with uh, prescription eye drops. And Dr. Chang, on those, uh, are any of those uh, drops and or treatments that you had referred to, are any of those covered by Medicare? So um, usually Medicare does not cover Lipiflow, that is uh, not covered by any insurance, that is an out of pocket um, procedure. Um, our clinic uh, charges relatively low price compared to everyone else in the state. But it is an out-of-pocket of approximately $800 uh, for both eyes. Um, it, it, it does um, have quite a bit of longevity of effect. Um, I would say most people, if they got a treatment, uh, it can be efficacious for anywhere from three to five years. Um, so it, it can be um, a worthwhile investment in your eyes. Uh, as far as the other eye drops, uh, many of them are, and most of them are not covered by Medicare, um, unfortunately. But uh, we do have options, and, and we, we kind of look at every individual's um, uh, insurance uh, status uh, um, um, very detailed and uh, try to get the most economical option. And I think going into that as well, Dr. Chang, I think uh, you know, pairing off of the, the lipoflow conversation, uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on how long does it take a patient from you know, the, the initial treatment of lipoflow or the, the start of the treatment process to uh, see results in their own eyes? And then is there a retreatment um, schedule that they will need to be on or are those lipoflow treatments uh, a one-time only situation? So this also has a quite a, a, a varied uh, results in that um, some patients uh, will uh, experience rapid improvement. Um, and I would probably say maybe half the patients will, uh, within the next uh, uh, couple days, feel like their eyes feel much, much better. Um, but there are uh, some patients who initially feel like they feel a little bit worse. And the reason they feel a little bit worse is that when we squeeze out all those oils that are kind of plugging up those, um, those uh, ducts, uh, there is a, uh, a transient period where there's no oils uh, that are uh, lubricating the eyes until the oils are being produced and then flow is reestablished. And that's why there's a, a, a regimen of supportive therapy that we do afterwards uh, to um, make you make a patient feel comfortable until the, the flow and the production of the oils are normalized in that four to eight week time period. I, I felt rapid relief uh, personally. Um, other doctors here who also had the uh, procedure uh, felt like they felt worse for the first two weeks and until they felt better. Um, every individual is uh, slightly different. When we have a follow-up, uh, we uh, do assess uh, the glands and we, what we want to see is uh, easy flow of the oils coming out of the ducts. If uh, over the course of several years uh, the uh, oils change in quality again and there is um, obstruction of the glands, uh, we may recommend a repeat um, um, lipid flow. Um, it can be done as many times as, as necessary, um, but I would uh, say for the, uh, for the bulk of the patients, uh, it can last several years. Great, and I have a, I have a person here asking about, uh, specifically they asked about keratoconus and scleral lenses. Uh, you know, I think we could probably expand that out to just specialty contact lenses in general, uh, where, you know, they may mm -hmm. cause some, you know, dry eye irritation type of issues in patients that have to wear those. Can these therapies help out with patients, um, you know, wearing, you know, either scleral contact lenses or other specialty lenses to help reduce those uh, symptoms? Yes, that's a very good question. First of all, keratoconus specifically can cause dry eye issues. Uh, depending on the severity of the keratoconus, 
um, if the cone is uh, highly misshapen and there is a cone, um, that cone is prone to drying up. You can think of kind of like a little mound. If you place water on top of it, it's going to go down the sides of that hill much more rapidly. So the apex of that cone can be prone to uh, drying up and um, uh, be at risk for scarring with um, severe dry eyes. So not only do keratoconus uh, patients have a higher incidence of dry eyes, if uh, they are wearing specialty contacts, whether it be rigid gas permeables, scleral contact lenses, or toric contact lenses, mm -hmm. uh, they can have issues with tolerance of wearing these contact lenses for a period of time. They may have increased mucus production, which makes their vision cloudy, requiring them to clean those scleral contact lenses multiple times throughout the day. So these patients really do need a very, very detailed uh, dry eye evaluation to not only keep their vision more stable, but to allow them to wear their contact lenses longer throughout the day. Great. And I have a question here about punctal plugs here. Um, and the question would be, if a punctal plug falls out or your eye isn't tearing, should it be replaced? Um, you know, the, this patient has a case of uh, an eye with the plug overflowing, um, you know, almost look like they're crying from one eye. Uh, so really any issues in terms of uh, punctal plug falling out or, or causing any issues in that area? That's a good question. And that's uh, kind of uh, a, um, doesn't have a clear cut answer. So if punctal plugs were placed in the eye and they um, helped uh, with uh, uh, the dry symptoms, uh, and if one has fallen out and the symptoms worsen, we would replace it. Punctal plugs can fall out with um, eye rubbing or even sneezing, or they may just get lax over time and just fall out. It's very important to have the right fit. You kind of want a snug fit so it stays in there as long as possible, and it can stay in there uh, with a good fit for several years. But if a punctal plug has fallen out and there's uh, minimal symptoms, and the patient is comfortable, I would advocate that we just kind of leave it out. Um, there are four uh, punctums um, that uh, uh, comprise the lacrimal system, upper and lower. We um, usually uh, put plugs in the lower tear ducts. Uh, for the most severe patients, we plug uppers and lower. Um, and if we do that, there is a risk of having some tearing since uh, the, the tear ducts are all uh, uh, occluded. So yeah, so it depends on the individual um, um, uh, whether or not we replace it. Great. Um, and then I, I do have you know, a, a lot of questions regarding insurance and, and Medicare coverage for these treatments. Uh, if, if these prospective patients here, if they were to call into your office, would you have staff that would be able to assist them in, you know, looking at their Medicare plans or insurance uh, plans to help coordinate a, a plan of action for their dry eye symptoms, would your staff be able to help out with that? Yes, yes. Uh, we are, um, we dedicate quite a bit of time to our dry eye uh, patients in um, navigating their insurance plans to have uh, the best coverage. Uh, it can be uh, a time consuming. Uh, we sometimes won't get the answers right away. Um, many insurance carriers will require pre-authorization, which we uh, do all the, the um, work for uh, on behalf of the patients. So the short, an short answer is yes, we, uh, we do all that uh, for the benefit of our patients. Now, I think you had mentioned earlier in terms of lipoflow um, and, and the average costs, um, of course, you know, after an evaluation and, and um, candidacy uh, check there, but uh, mentioned it being around $800 for bilateral or both eye uh, treatment. Uh, do you also, also offer financing capabilities for that out-of-pocket cost? Yes, uh, they can uh, finance that with uh, care credit. Um, that is um, um, something that is available for our patients. Great. Um, looking through, I have one more question that was emailed in here that I wanted to make sure we got to here. Um, let me read that off to you um, as I pull it up here. Just lost it here. Um, living in Colorado here, you know, are there any symptoms that we as Coloradans 
uh, or any external factors through the environment that uh, we need to be worried about, say time of year when dry eye symptoms may become more severe or things like the fires that are going around uh, across our state right now that we should be weary of and keep an eye out that may worsen our dry eye symptoms. Yes, um, there are several factors that uh, we look for in particular. Uh, one is uh, underlying allergy. If uh, with our four seasons, uh, there are many times uh, during the year where uh, we may be um, vulnerable to certain allergens in the air. It could be in the fall as things kind of uh, disintegrate and uh, we can have uh, issues with uh, allergies then. It could be in the spring and summer when pollen is quite um, um, abundant in the air. And when you have these allergies, um, there is a, a marked decline in tear production, making dry eyes worse. So we need to un, uh, treat the underlying allergies um, um, to um, treat the dry eye symptoms. Colorado is also very windy. Colorado Springs in particular, there's quite a bit of wind. We're very active. Um, there can be more evaporative loss on windy days, um, making one symptoms worse. Uh, we already know there's very low humidity, and just the altitude itself uh, can uh, keep us maybe in a little bit more dehydrated state, uh, affecting our, our symptoms. So there's many different factors that are uh, involved um, living here in Colorado that can make our uh, dry eyes uh, worse. Great. And then I had uh, one other question here. Um, specifically in terms of the, the drop schedule, uh, you know, and, and remembering to take your drops on time and, you know, even then, you know, forgetting to take the drops and then having dry eye symptoms appear uh, and then trying to chase those dry eye symptoms with drops afterwards, uh, you know, and, and for folks out there that are having trouble keeping with that schedule, uh, you know, the other options that we've discussed today, lip of flow, punctal plugs, is that something that a patient who's experiencing those types of issues with drops, you know, should come in and get an evaluation or, or find out if they're a candidate for some of these other options, would they maybe help those patients? Yes, um, you know, it's, um, you can't really uh, describe the effect of uh, dry eyes on the quality of life. Uh, I think many of our attendees may uh, have moderate to severe dry eyes, and we, and we know how trying to adhere to a, a regimen of uh, multiple drops throughout the day can uh, affect our uh, uh, satisfaction. Uh, I have dry eyes and I have a difficult time uh, maintaining a routine, uh, but I think we all do in our busy, busy lives. Um, so those are things that we do discuss. Uh, what we would like to do in an ideal situation is, is to have the minimal amount of eye drops that provide maximum relief. Uh, some of these medications can uh, decrease the frequency of teardrops, um, making it uh, one um, 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 less prone to missing, um, having um, adverse effects of missing drops throughout the day or throughout the week. Um, the lipid flow can also improve one's symptoms, though, which is just a, a short, uh, um, um, you know, in-office procedure that can also help. Uh, minimize uh, the amount of medications and teardrops we use. So, um, yeah, we need to uh, kind of develop a, uh, a plan to uh, uh, minimize as much uh, work involved in treating the dry eyes because it can be um, very difficult to do day after day. Great, and I have a, a question that just popped up here in the uh, questionnaire, and it, it's really interesting um, because I don't know that I've heard this, uh, you know, too often, right? And in, in uh, webinars and in dry eye information is, you know, my eyes get very dry while I'm sleeping, but seem to be, be fine while I'm awake. Uh, you know, is this something that you guys have seen before, able to treat, etc.? Yes, yes. Um, so um, I uh, discuss with patients um, the timing of their dryness, and um, many of them will uh, complain that it's worse when they're sleeping and that it frequently wakes them up and they have to get up and put teardrops in. Or some patients, uh, me included, uh, will state that it's worse in the morning. It's very, very blurry and hard to open their eyes. And the reason why this occurs is that when we go to sleep, we don't produce tears. And uh, the tear prediction is 
production is basically turned off. And that's why when you go to sleep, uh, without adding a, a thicker gel or ointment type of um, eye drop to help lubricate while you're sleeping, um, many patients can uh, feel uh, worsening symptoms uh, when they're sleeping. We also look at uh, lid abnormalities. Uh, a lot of patients have issues with eyelids not closing. Um, and if there's a little kind of exposure during sleeping, they can have a, a desiccation of the cornea, making their symptoms worse. Um, we have uh, patients who are on CPAP machines, and there are usually small micro leaks that can also um, dry their eyes while they're sleeping. So this is a very common complaint. Great. And then uh, the next question here that I have is, can you discuss eyelid wipes um, uh, from a prospective patient out there and um, you know, how they may be similar or different from the treatments we've discussed today? Uh, eyelid wipes are um, designed to uh, treat the meibomian gland uh, dysfunction or blepharitis. They're um, advised for patients who have uh, crusty uh, eyelids that, um, as we discussed before, where they have uh, blockage of uh, the, the uh, um, meibomian glands. Um, they can be beneficial. Uh, but they have quite a bit of preservatives and chemicals. Uh, if the patient uh, relies on them um, and uses them frequently, they can get some um, uh, irritation on the skin uh, with frequent use. Um, they're okay if used occasionally. Uh, I prefer uh, patients using a very gentle detergent like a baby shampoo. And if we have a, a small dilute amount on a warm soapy washcloth, uh, cleaning the eyes uh, with a little bit of the heat uh, with the warm water and the washcloth with the detergent action uh, from the baby shampoo to remove that uh, oily layer that uh, accumulates uh, throughout the day can uh, be um, a little bit more effective in my opinion. Great. And then uh, another question here. If I have few lipid, gl lipid glands, will the lipoflow work for me? So uh, it sounds like a reduced uh, amount of lipid glands. Yes, it depends. Uh, the, the lipid view will assess how much damage uh, there may or may not be. And it can occur at any age. We have patients who come in who are in their 30s that have a tremendous amount of uh, atrophy. And that's a poor prognosis because as they grow older, they uh, could have a lot more scarring fibrosis and they can really develop uh, severe dry eyes at a very young age. Uh, but if uh, one has significant damage, it is important to uh, preserve uh, the remaining glandular tissue. So the lipid flow uh, is uh, a definite uh, uh, um, um, treatment option to kind of keep that glandular tissue from uh, worsening. <laughs> Little sound there. Um, are you still with me, Dr. Chang? Yes, still here. Okay, good. Um, so uh, I have a patient here asking about dry eye, uh, you know, with uh, a little bit of dry eye in the right eye only following cataract surgery, um, left eye being okay you know, post-cataract surgery, dry eye, you know, is that something you see often and how do you, you know, take care of those solutions? Yes, uh, dry eye um, symptoms uh, is the most common uh, side effect with uh, cataract surgery. The um, surgery itself, the multiple eye drops uh, used uh, in treating the uh, post-operative period uh, can um, cause dry eyes and can cause worsening of dry eyes temporarily. Um, um, we, we see it every day. Um, and, uh, and once again, living in Colorado doesn't help. Um, so when we treat this, uh, we uh, do a lot of reassuring that it should get better. Uh, we um, we uh, advise uh, frequent uh, usage of preservative-free artificial tears during this period. Um, but uh, it can take several weeks for it to improve. Um, uh, but that is a, uh, uh, the most common um, uh, adverse uh, issue with uh, cataract surgery. Great. And um, I also have a question here, somebody uh, referring to 
uh, uh, blue light filter lenses, right? And, and I'm assuming looking at computer strain, obviously in the digital age with uh, the increased screen time that we see, which can of course lead to uh, dry eyes. How do your treatments play into, you know, dry eye symptoms from, you know, being at a screen all day and, and having that computer vision syndrome? Um, the blue, uh, the blocking of the blue light um, is a, uh, um, very uh, popular these days. And um, uh, for some individuals uh, treating or uh, basically kind of diminishing that part of the light spectrum can give less eye strain. I would say it's more or less eye strain than uh, dry eye issues. Uh, whether you block that or not, uh, we, we do have um, uh, less uh, blinking. Uh, and, um, and, and there's still going to be uh, strain involved with seeing it at a computer screen. Uh, if you're younger, you can have more accommodative uh, accommodation to kind of focus uh, at that uh, intermediate distance. If one is uh, older, uh, presbyopic, or even pseudophagic with uh, cataract surgery, getting that uh, computer screen in focus is uh, first and foremost, uh, and then um, supporting with artificial tears in front of the computer all day. And if you, one feels that the brightness and particularly the blue part of the spectrum out of a, a bright screen, if, if they uh, can feel and sense that there's less eye strain, it can be beneficial. But it's, it's um, very much an individual um, kind of phenomenon. I have a question here um, referring to dermadex mites uh, and uh, the best treatment to use against those that would be dermadex mites. Yes, uh, dermadex is um, a frequently underdiagnosed um, issue with lepharitis. And dermadex are these kind of small microscopic lice-like uh, organisms that grow and live on the eyelids. Uh, just like hair lice, um, there are lice that um, can lay eggs and um, reproduce on the eyelid margin. They can cause a very severe um, blepharitis. Uh, one will have a lot of uh, uh, kind of exudative uh, uh, production over the eyelashes. One can see some areas of pinpot uh, or pinpoint uh, blood from the the Demodex uh, feeding on the lids. Uh, a very effective way to treat them is uh, tea tree oil. Tea tree oil will help uh, kind of suffocate these uh, um, little creatures and, and, and to treat them. Um, so yes, that's a very good, very good question. Great, and uh, just two more here with you, Dr. Chang, and we'll let you go. Thank you for being so patient here and going through all these uh, questions. Um, I have my left eye will sometimes become severely bloodshot. It does not um, itch or or have anything coming from it. Um, if they use their adva advanced eye drops, you know, several times a day at night, they can get the bloodshot to dissipate. Um, you know, trying to remember to take these drops, but uh, specifically, I guess, in terms of bloodshot eyes, you know, recommendations you might have for patients experiencing that. Mm, well, that's a very difficult one to treat many times. Um, I do have patients who complain of having bloodshot eyes, and, and that is their only um, kind of symptom. And it can be hard to treat. Uh, we all would love to have uh, wide eyes like little children do, uh, but as uh, part of the aging process, our uh, eyes do reveal uh, increased uh, uh, caliber and redness of our um, uh, blood vessels, uh, making them uh, look a little bit more prominent or even bloodshot. If um, one has dry eyes and severe, the, the resulting inflammation can make it uh, look uh, inflamed and injected and swollen. Um, so dry therapy can improve that for many patients. Um, the blepharitis is a very frequent um, kind of factor in uh, making uh, the bloodshot uh, eyes uh, look more red. Um, but in some cases, we aren't able to get it perfectly white. And so we have to kind of have um, reasonable expect expectations of how much redness we can kind of improve upon 
Um, and um, for the vast majority, we can in, in, in make it appear much better. Um, but it's it's uh, it's a kind of a little bit more complex issue than uh, just dry eyes itself. Great. And uh, my last question for you would be uh, almost a two-part question here. Uh, first being, um, are these services available in all of your locations, in specific locations? And then, you know, if, if a patient is, you know, it's starting to or experiencing dry eye symptoms and, and things that you've talked about in this presentation, what does that initial step look like for them in terms of, you know, contacting your clinic, the, the first appointment? You know, how do they essentially get started with you and in what locations can they uh, use to, uh, you know, either go through candidacy and or treatments? Okay, very good. Um, a dry eye evaluation can be um, performed at any one of our locations. Uh, that is um, simply an eye exam. Um, I, um, of course, treat dry eyes, but I will mention that uh, other providers, uh, particularly our optometrists, are very skilled at treating dry eyes. It's kind of um, a basic part of our training. So um, um, any one of our um, uh, providers can uh, uh, do a consultation. Um, punctal plugs are available at every location if necessary. Um, the lip flow and the lip view are, is located only at our Colorado Springs Union office. So, for example, if you were seeing our Pueblo office and, and would benefit from the lipid, lipid uh, flow, uh, we would schedule an appointment for you to have it up here. Great. Well, I think that covers it. Dr. Chang, thank you so much for your time today. And everybody that joined, I know there was a, a lot of questions and a lot of information. Um, I'll reiterate once again here, we'll be reaching out to, to everyone here that registered and attended uh, with a, a link to view this webinar. Again, ask any questions. Of course, you have the phone number here on the screen, 719-630-3937, uh, or visit us online at skylinevisionclinic.com. Uh, we look forward to seeing with you and uh, hope you have a wonderful Colorado weekend. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Josh. Hey, take care.